From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! It's a great honor to have the Crown Prince with us. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been uh, a very great friend and a big purchaser of equipment and lots of other things. As the Saudi bombardment and siege of Yemen continues, President Trump welcomes Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, to the White House and announces a $12.5 billion arms sale. We'll speak with Mehdi Hassan of Al Jazeera and Code Pink co-founder Medea Benjamin. Look at the history of how those arms have been used. You talk, uh, talked about their use in devastating Yemen. We also have the example of them crushing the democratic uprising in neighboring Bahrain, using those weapons to fund al-Qaeda groups in Iraq and in Syria, and using those weapons internally to crush dissent, particularly in the Shia areas. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Austin, Texas, authorities have identified the man they say was responsible for a series of six bombings that killed two people and injured at least six others, saying the bomber left behind a video confession. Police say Mark Anthony Condit, a 23-year-old white man from Austin's suburbs, died after he blew himself up in his car Wednesday morning as police surrounded him. In a news conference Wednesday afternoon with Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott, Austin Police Chief Brian Manley described an as-yet unreleased 25-minute video that Condit recorded on his cell phone. Manley said the video shows Condit describing details of how he built six bombs used in the attack. Despite that, Chief Manley described Condit as a troubled young man rather than a terrorist or someone driven by hate. I know everybody is interested in a motive and understanding why, and we are never going to be able to put a ration behind these acts. But what I can tell you, having listened to that recording, he does not at all mention anything about terrorism, nor does he mention anything about hate. But instead, it is the outcry of a very uh, challenged young man talking about challenges in his personal life. The two people killed in the bombings were both members of prominent African-American families in Austin. In blog posts, Condit described himself as a conservative who was anti-abortion, anti-marriage equality and pro-death penalty. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers have reached a deal on a $1.3 trillion spending bill that would see a record expansion of the U.S. military, while failing to provide relief to immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children. If approved ahead of a deadline at the end of Friday, the measure would avert a third government shutdown. The bill does not address the DACA program, which gives hundreds of thousands of young undocumented immigrants legal permission to live and work in the United States. President Trump tried to cancel DACA last year, although he's repeatedly been blocked from doing so by the courts. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg broke his silence over a burgeoning scandal Wednesday, telling CNN he's sorry his company allowed a voter profiling company named Cambridge Analytica to harvest the data of more than 50 million Facebook users without their permission in efforts to sway voters to support President Donald Trump. So this was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. So our responsibility now is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Zuckerberg's apology came days after CBS reported Facebook knew about Cambridge Analytica's data harvesting two years ago, but failed to report the practice to users. Cambridge Analytica was founded by billionaire Robert Mercer, Trump's former advisor Steve Bannon of Breitbart News, one of the company's key strategists. Attorney General Jeff Sessions instructed federal prosecutors on Wednesday to seek the death penalty in drug-related cases, saying execution should be used as a deterrent to combat the opioid epidemic. The announcement came amidst a push by President Trump to apply capital punishment to drug dealers, citing favorably the policies of Chinese President Xi Jinping and Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte, who's boasted of killing drug dealers himself. In Israel, a military court reached a plea deal Wednesday with Ahad Tamimi, 
the 17-year-old Palestinian girl who became a hero to Palestinians after viral video showed her slapping a soldier near her family's home in the occupied West Bank. The incident came just after Ahad Tamimi learned that her 15-year-old cousin, Mohammed Tamimi, had been shot in the head at close range by an Israeli soldier using a rubber-coated steel bullet. Ahad Tamimi faced 12 charges, including assaulting a soldier and incitement to violence. Under terms of the plea deal, Ahad Tamimi's lawyer says the 17-year-old will be sentenced to eight months in jail and must pay a fine of 5,000 shekels, or about $1,400. After the plea agreement was presented, Ahad Tamimi told reporters in the courtroom there is no justice under the occupation. Her father, Bassem Tamimi, later told Reuters the case attracted the attention of Westerners because of his daughter's light skin and blonde hair. When the European people see my daughter blonde and the blue eye, they they shocked because they saw, saw their, their children in front of them. It broke the stereotype of the image of the Palestinian in the international community, which the brainwash by the media, formal media, done for the Palestinian. They saw the Palestinian like them. We'll have more on the case of Ahed Tamimi with our guests after headlines. In Burma, a pair of Reuters journalists reached their 100th day behind bars Wednesday, as they face up to 14 years in prison for allegedly violating Burma's Official Secrets Act. Walon and Cha Sou were arrested on December 12th as they investigated a massacre committed by the Burmese military targeting Rohingya Muslims in the village of Indin in September, as police led them away from a courthouse in Rangoon. Cha Sou briefly held his young daughter and addressed reporters. I would like to record for my daughter that people who reported the truth were detained and put behind bars in Burma. I want my daughter to know when she grows up that this is a shame. Please record this so that my daughter knows the things that happen with this government. The truth seekers were arrested, were put behind bars, and media freedom was curtailed. On Wednesday, members of Hong Kong's Foreign Correspondence Club said it has gathered 42,000 signatures calling for the release of the Burmese journalists. Members of the club say Burma's embassy in Hong Kong closed its doors early Wednesday in an effort to avoid receiving the petition. In Nigeria, dozens of schoolgirls who'd been kidnapped from their school in the northern town of Dapchi were released Wednesday, more than a month after they were taken during a raid by Boko Haram militants. Government officials say 101 of the 110 girls who were abducted February 19th were returned and that at least five girls died during their ordeal. One witness said the five were crushed to death as militants herded them into vehicles to be returned. Many of the girls showed signs of dehydration and malnourishment. In Peru, President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski resigned on Wednesday, one day after he was scheduled to face an impeachment trial, after videos surfaced showing his allies trying to bribe opposition lawmakers. In a national address, President Kuczynski proclaimed his innocence, even as he said he would step aside. In the face of this difficult situation that has developed and has unjustly made me appear guilty of acts that I have not participated in, I think the best thing for the country is that I resign as president of the republic. Peru's vice president, Martin Vizcarra, will replace Kuczynski, who narrowly survived an impeachment vote late last year after he attempted to conceal his business ties to a Brazilian construction firm, which is at the center of a massive corruption scandal that has spread across Latin America. America. Back in the United States, the Federal Reserve Wednesday raised interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point in the first such hike since Fed Chair Jerome Powell replaced Janet Yellen as head of the U.S. Central Bank. Powell signaled the Fed is prepared to raise rates two more times this year amidst pressure from investors who fear rising wages for blue-collar workers are adding to inflation. 
A veteran Fox News analyst has quit the cable news network, saying he can no longer work for the channel in good conscience. In an open letter released Tuesday, retired U.S. Army Colonel Ralph Peters writes Fox News hosts routinely dismiss facts and empirical reality. Peter also blasted the network over its unwavering support for President Trump, writing, quote, In my view, Fox has degenerated from providing a legitimate and much-needed outlet for conservative voices to a mere propaganda machine for a destructive and ethically ruinous administration." Unquote. The Washington Post reports more than 187,000 students have been exposed to gun violence at school in the 19 years since the Columbine High School massacre in 1999. Despite the high number, school shootings represent only a tiny fraction of U.S. gun violence, which claims more than 13,000 lives in the United States each year. The Post report comes days ahead of Saturday's historic March for Our Lives rally in Washington, D.C., which will be led by student survivors of the Parkland, Florida, high school massacre. Tune into our coverage from the Washington, D.C. rally. We will begin. Democracy Now! will be there broadcasting from noon to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. In Tempe, Arizona, Police investigators have released video from a self-driving car operated by Uber showing an emergency backup driver, a human, was not paying attention to the road in the moments leading up to a fatal crash. An external camera shows the car about to strike pedestrian Elaine Hertzberg, who is pushing a bicycle across the four-lane road. An internal camera recording shows driver Rafaela Vasquez looking down and failing to pay attention to the road just before the car struck Hertzberg, who's believed to be the first pedestrian killed in association with new self-driving technology. In New York City, advocates for taxi workers say an immigrant cab driver committed suicide as he faced financial ruin due to a shift away from yellow cabs and toward ride-hailing app-based services like Uber and Lyft. 65-year-old Nikanor Ochisor, who drove a New York City yellow cab for nearly 30 years, was found hanged to death from a wooden beam in a Queen's garage last Friday. Ochisor owned a taxi medallion and shared driving duties with his wife, who picked up morning shifts while he worked evenings in an unsuccessful struggle to make ends meet. The New York Taxi Workers Alliance say Ochisor's death is the fourth such suicide of a driver in recent months. In February, livery car driver Douglas Shifter killed himself outside the gates of New York City Hall after writing in a suicide, night, uh, suicide note posted to Facebook, quote, I will not be a slave working for chump change. I would rather be dead. To see our discussion of what taxi drivers face, you can go to democracynow.org. In Sacramento, California, police have released a pair of videos showing the moments before two officers shot and killed 22-year-old Stefan Clark, an African-American father of two who was gunned down in his own backyard. At the time of the killing, officers were investigating a 911 call reporting someone in a hoodie in the neighborhood breaking the windows of cars. One newly released video, taken from a police helicopter, shows thermal images of Clark being pursued outside his home by the two officers who draw their pistols on him. All I can tell is he's got a hoodie on. He's uh, running through the front yard of 29th Street. He's looking into another car that's uh, in between the fence and the front yard. Another disturbing video from a body camera worn by one of the officers shows the moment Clark was killed in a hail of 20 bullets as both officers open fire on him. Show me your hands, get your gun! Five, seven shots fired, seven, eight down. Sacramento's police department say the officers waited for about five minutes before approaching Clark to administer medical attention after they shot him in his own yard. The officers initially claimed they opened fire after Clark advanced toward them, holding an object they believed was a gun. In a separate statement, the department later said the officers believed at the time Clark was holding a toolbar. Clark was found to have only a cell phone on him at the time of his death. 
Mississippi Republican Governor Phil Bryant has named the state's agriculture commissioner, Cindy Hyde-Smith, to serve as U.S. senator, as fellow Republican Thad Cochran steps aside due to poor health. Hyde-Smith will become the first woman Mississippi has ever sent to Congress. She's expected to immediately begin campaigning for a special election for the Senate seat in November. New York City has launched an investigation into the real estate company founded by President Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner, amidst reports the company illegally falsified building permits. City officials are looking into an Associated Press report that Kushner companies regularly claimed it had no rent-regulated tenants in its buildings, when, in fact, it had hundreds, in a move that allowed the company to skirt regulations. The AP reports the false documents were filed while Jared Kushner was running the company and before he joined the Trump White House. New York City Council member Richie Torres says he'll make a criminal referral if the city uncovers evidence that Jared Kushner committed a crime. If convicted on a local charge, Kushner would not be eligible for a presidential pardon. The probe came as a New York tenants' rights group filed suit against Kushner Companies, alleging it neglected properties and used round-the-clock construction to force tenants out of rent-stabilized homes. This is Aaron Carr of the group Housing Rights Initiative speaking Monday. It is abundantly clear that Kushner Companies made the lives of its tenants a living hell. From tactics that include around-the-clock construction, rodent infestation, potential asbestos exposure, black mold, collapsed buildings, and, yes, even collapsed buildings. Construction harassment is literally a form of physical and psychological torture. It is designed to make the living situation of a tenant unbearable to the point where they are willing to give up the most valuable thing a tenant can have in New York City in the midst of an affordable housing crisis, affordability. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. On Tuesday, President Trump met with Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman at the White House, where the two leaders finalized a $12.5 billion weapons deal. This comes less than a year after Trump announced a $110 billion arms deal for the Saudis. During the meeting, Trump held up posters of recent Saudi weapons purchases from the United States and said, quote, we make the best equipment in the world. Some of the things that we're now working on, thanks, and that have been ordered and will uh, shortly be started in construction and delivered, THAD system, $13 billion, the C-130 uh, uh, airplanes, the Hercules, great plane, $3.8 billion, the Bradley vehicles. That's the tanks, $1.2 billion, and the uh, P-8 Poseidons, $1.4 billion. Human rights groups warn the massive arms deal may make the United States complicit in war crimes committed in the Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen. Outside the White House, peace activists with Code Pink denounced bin Salman as a violent and dangerous war criminal. The arms deal comes as the Senate rejected a bipartisan resolution to end U.S. military involvement in Yemen within 30 days, unless Congress formally authorizes the military action. The vote was 44 to 55, with 10 Democrats joining the Republican majority to block the legislation, and Arizona Senator John McCain not casting a vote. The U.S.-backed Saudi-led airstrikes and naval blockade have devastated Yemen's health, water and sanitation systems, sparking a massive cholera outbreak and pushing millions of Yemenis to the brink of starvation. More than 15,000 people have died since the Saudi invasion in 2015. During an interview on CBS 60 Minutes, Prince Mohammed bin Salman blamed the humanitarian crisis in Yemen on the Houthis. This is host Nora O'Donnell questioning bin Salman. Do you acknowledge that it has been a humanitarian catastrophe, 5,000 civilians killed and children starving there? It is truly very painful, and I hope that this militia ceases using the humanitarian situation to their advantage in order to draw sympathy from the international community. They block humanitarian aid in order to create famine and a humanitarian crisis. 
Prince bin Salman's trip has also raised new questions about his relationship with President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who is tasked with brokering an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. The Intercept reports that bin Salman has boasted he has Kushner, quote, in his pocket. In October, when Kushner made an unannounced trip to Riyadh, the two reportedly discussed the names of Saudis who were disloyal to the crown prince amid a power struggle. A week later, the Saudi government arrested and imprisoned dozens of members of the Saudi royal family, reportedly torturing at least one. Well, for more, we go to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by two guests. Medea Benjamin is with us, co-founder of Co Pink, author of the book Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Her latest article for Common Dreams, Don't Believe the Media Hype About Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman, her forthcoming book, Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Also joining us in D.C. is Mehdi Hassan, award-winning British journalist and broadcaster at Al Jazeera English. He's host of the Al Jazeera interview program Up Front and a columnist for The Intercept. Mehdi Hassan's most recent piece is headlined, The CBS Interview with Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman Was a Crime Against Journalism. His new podcast for The Intercept will go live tomorrow. It's called Deconstructed. Medea Benjamin, Mehdi Hassan, welcome to Democracy Now! Mehdi, if you can start off by talking about the significance of the Crown Prince's trip to Washington, D.C., President Trump's announcement of the latest weapons deal with Saudi Arabia, and how the media is covering it all. Uh, thanks, Amy. Yes, it's, uh, it's a big deal. MBS is on his uh, tour. He's been to the U.K. He's coming to the U.S. for a two-week tour. He's not just going to be in D.C. with Trump and the administration. He's also visiting the Facebooks and the, uh, the tech guys in Silicon Valley and Hollywood, too, because he's a reformer or he's a revolutionary. Or that's what uh, some in the U.S. media want us to believe. 60 Minutes, you just played some clips there. Nora O'Donnell on 60 Minutes uh, wrote the, uh, did this awful interview. Yes, I wrote a piece saying it was a crime against journalism. Because here is a guy who is the representative of an absolute monarchy, is going to be the next absolute monarch, is de facto ruler of that absolute monarchy, with one of the worst human rights records in the world, in the midst of an awful war in Yemen, as you just mentioned. And yet he comes to the U.S. and is treated as a reformer, a revolutionary, gets softball questions, gets a meeting with Trump in the White House, where they talk about arms sales, so more war in Yemen with more American arms. The whole thing is a travesty, and if it was an Iranian uh, government official or a North Korean official or a Syrian official, we would all be up in arms. And yet, because it's a U.S. ally, 80 years a U.S. ally, we kind of accept it and shrug our shoulders. Medea Benjamin, you've written extensively about Saudi Arabia. Code Pink had a protest outside um, <clears throat> the meeting yesterday. I want to go continue with this issue of U.S. media coverage of the Crown Prince. It wasn't just the CBS interview that lavished praise on Mohammed bin Salman. Last month, Washington Post columnist David Ignatius interviewed Salman in Riyadh and wrote a piece headlined, The Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia is Giving His Country Shock Therapy, in which he praised Salman's reform on women's rights, saying there is, quote, cultural ferment in the kingdom. Ignatius went on to write, quote, women tell visitors what kind of cars they plan to buy when they're allowed to drive in June. New gyms for women are opening. Women entrepreneurs are operating food trucks and women sports fans are attending public soccer games. Ignatius also mentions that MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, gave the interview entirely in English. In the same paper, Dennis Ross wrote an op-ed ahead of Salman's visit headlined, America should get behind Saudi Arabia's revolutionary crown prince, saying his efforts to change Saudi society, quote, amount to a revolution from above. He alludes to the war in Yemen towards the end of the article, only to say, quote, on Yemen, Qatar and Lebanon, had the Saudis discussed their options with the United States first, we might have created a more effective division of labor to achieve our shared aims. Medea Benjamin, your response to all of this. It's just disgusting the way the Western press is eating up the propaganda of the Saudi regime. Uh, let's look at the basics of the Saudi regime. It is a regime where there is no freedom of speech, no freedom of press, no freedom of religion, where you could get the death penalty if you're an atheist or a homosexual. It's the most gender-segregated society in the world. Women live under a guardianship system, where a man has the right to determine the most important things in the women's life, uh, where 
there are no national elections whatsoever, where there is no um, freedom of uh, uh, independent trade unions, any kind of civic organizations. Uh, this is one of the most repressive countries in the world, and it should be treated by the Western press as one of the most repressive countries in the world, and they should be able to look behind the uh, minder tours that they get when they go to Saudi Arabia, and they are constantly taken around by government people. Saudi citizens are afraid to talk. In fact, I was at a Saudi event last night with a camera trying to talk to people. They are absolutely afraid. Even if they're supporters of the government, they don't want to be seen on the camera, because they live in fear. And the media is also putting out that the crown prince is greatly beloved, especially by the young people in Saudi Arabia. Well, if people are afraid that they would be be thrown in jail, like Raif Badawi, who's been uh, put in prison for 10 years for a blog, of course they're not going to talk to Western reporters and give a critique of the Saudi prince, much less the kingdom itself. Well, we're going to break and then come back to our discussion, this highly significant uh, visit of the crown prince of Saudi in the midst of the U.S.-backed Saudi bombardment of Yemen, where over 15,000 Yemenis uh, have died. Um, cholera cases are now at over 1 million. Our guests are Mehdi Hassan of Al Jazeera English and The Intercept and Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink. Stay with us. There's a toilet on the roof in the sky, don't care. Blood enemies and holy fools in the sky, don't care. We're burning down in flames in the sky. Don't Care by Rasha Nahas here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. Earlier this week, the Senate rejected a bipartisan resolution to end the U.S. military involvement in Yemen within 30 days, unless Congress formally authorizes the military action. The bill would have forced the first ever vote in the Senate to withdraw U.S. armed forces from an unauthorized war. By a vote of 55 to 44, senators voted against a procedural motion that would have advanced the measure. This is Vermont. Senator Bernie Sanders speaking Tuesday before the vote. Some will argue that American troops are not out there shooting and getting shot at, not exchanging fire, gunfire with their enemies, and that we are not really engaged in the horrifically destructive Saudi led war in Yemen. That's what some will argue on the floor today, that we're really not engaged in hostilities. We're not exchanging fire. Well, please tell that to the people of Yemen, whose homes and lives <coughs> are being destroyed by weapons marked made in the USA, dropped by planes being refueled by the U.S. military, on targets chosen with U.S. assistance. Only in the narrowest, most legalistic terms can anyone argue that the United States is not actively involved in hostilities alongside of Saudi Arabia in Yemen. And let me take a minute to tell my colleagues what is happening in Yemen right now, because a lot of people don't know. It's not something that is on the front pages of the newspapers or covered terribly much in television. 
Right now, in a very, very poor nation of 27 million people, that is the nation of Yemen, in November of last year, the United Nations Emergency Relief Coordinator told us that Yemen was on the brink of, quote, the largest famine the world has seen for many decades, end of quote, from the United Nations. So far, in this country of 27 million people, this very poor country, over 10,000 civilians have been killed and 40,000 civilians have been wounded. Over 3 million people in Yemen, in a nation of 27 million, have been displaced, driven from their homes. 15 million people lack access to clean water and sanitation because water treatment plants have been destroyed. More than 20 million people in Yemen, over two-thirds of the population of that country, need some kind of humanitarian support, with nearly 10 million in acute need of assistance. More than one million suspected cholera cases have been reported, representing potentially the worst cholera outbreak in world history. So that's Senator Bernie Sanders speaking on Tuesday before uh, uh, the Senate vote. Mehdi Hassan, could you comment on, on what he said and also explain uh, what Saudi Arabia is trying to do in Yemen and why the U.S. is supporting Saudi Arabia? Uh, it's a good question when you say try and explain what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen. I think a lot of people would wonder, yes, what is Saudi Arabia doing in Yemen, including a lot of Saudis now who are wondering. This war was declared uh, in 2015. It was supposed to be done quickly, a Saudi-led coalition of Arab nations against, quote-unquote, Houthi rebels backed by Iran, allegedly. Um, and this was the case where MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, at the time wasn't the crown prince. He was a deputy crown prince and the defense minister. Um, and he was pushing this war. It was going to be a quick... Uh, simple war, you know, the richest countries in the Middle East against the poorest country. And yet, three years later, still mired in this horrific war with all of those humanitarian consequences that Bernie Sanders mentioned on the floor of the Senate. Um, it's a disaster. It's been called an apocalypse by UN officials. It's been called the world, world's worst humanitarian crisis. And, you know, by all intents and purposes, it is a U.S.-Saudi war, I mean, It's not just a Saudi-led war. As Bernie Sanders pointed out, it's U.S. refueling uh, Saudi jets. Uh, it's U.S. providing arms and bombs. It's U.S. providing intel to Saudi officials, diplomatic cover in international forums. Uh, and yet, Americans don't know enough about it because the media doesn't cover it. And when it does cover it, it doesn't mention the Saudi role. And it's been a disaster. There's no end in sight. MBS said in that 60 Minutes interview on Sunday, you know, it's all the fault of the Houthis and it's all the fault of Iran and showed no signs of, you know, any, any prospect of bringing this horrific war to an end. We rightly get agitated about what goes on in Syria and the, bombing, uh, the bombings in Aleppo and elsewhere. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, a dictator who we, who we're not arming who we're not supporting. And yet in Yemen, there's a war going on which has horrific humanitarian consequences. And that's a dictator, the Saudi dictators, who we do support and arm. So I find the whole thing slightly absurd and, and morally grotesque. Um, but, you know, the U.S. is not going to do anything. To go back to the earlier question that we began the show with, MBS's visit is such a big deal because he's such a close ally of the U.S. And Donald Trump, remember, came to office claiming he was going to be a Saudi critic. People forget, when Donald Trump was running for election, he accused the Saudis of being behind 9-11. He said he might not buy oil from the Saudis. He attacked Hillary Clinton for taking money from the Saudis because they were human rights abusers. And yet, since coming to office, he went to Saudi Arabia first. The first foreign visit he made was to Saudi Arabia. He uh, now praises MBS and his father, the King Salman. He welcomed him to the White House on Tuesday, and he said, they've got lots of money. We want that money. We're going to have a great relationship. For Trump, it's always about money. So expect no change. Um, but although one, you know, one bit of good news, that vote, 55 uh, to 45, I think it was, that's much narrower than previous, quote, unquote, anti-Saudi votes on Capitol Hill have been. On, on Capitol Hill, at least, uh, there's far more criticism of Saudi Arabia than there has been any time that I can think of in recent memory. You know, we just interviewed Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, who uh, joined with uh, Sanders uh, in pushing for this. 
Now, um, I wanted to ask you, Medea Benjamin, last year, um, the Trump administration approved the resumption of sales of precision-guided munitions to Saudi Arabia. President Obama had frozen some of those weapon sales last year due to concerns about civilian casualties in Saudi Arabia's expanding war in Yemen. Uh, now, Obama didn't cut off the support, but he did restrict it. Trump took those restrictions off. Um, you have been deeply concerned about this vote. Can you explain? what happened on the floor of the Senate? Well, I want to give kudos to Bernie Sanders and Chris Murphy and Mike Lee, a conservative Republican, who introduced this resolution using a very unique angle, which is the War Powers Act, to say this is an unconstitutional war. It has never been voted on by Congress. Congress has not only the authority, but the obligation to declare war. And this certainly does not fit under the 2001 authorization for the use of military force that was passed after 9-11 to attack those associated uh, involved in the 9-11 attack or associated forces. So it was a very good argument, and I think it's uh, horrific that 10 Democrats defected and voted for this, and that so many, uh, almost all of the Republicans, uh, have shown themselves to be the war party and to not want to take on their constitutional duty to declare war or not declare war, uh, to allow President Trump to continue continue with this war in Yemen. And so I think we should go back and look at all of those who voted in favor of continuing this war, to tell them they have the blood of Yemeni people on their hands. And when we see those amateur graphs that President Trump held up to talk about all the weapon sales and showed the states in which there were jobs being created by those weapon sales, showed them in red. Think of them as the blood of the Yemeni people, that it's the, their, their deaths and their famine that's creating jobs in the United States. And then ask yourself about the morality, not just of President Trump, but of this country and of our Congress, that will be delighted by the creation of jobs uh, in on the backs of the people of Yemen who are suffering the largest catastrophe in the United States. What does this say about our country? What does it tell the rest of the world about the morals? of the United States. And to be clear, the man he's sitting with, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, um, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, even before he was crown prince, and he's taken over this power after arresting, what, hundreds of uh, people in Saudi Arabia, a number of members of the Saudi royal family, right after um, uh, Jared Kushner met with him in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he was in charge of this war even before he was crown prince. Well, that's right. This is his war. And that's why when anybody talks about him as a reformer, no, you have to say he's not a reformer. He is a war criminal. And the shakedown that he uh, presided over in Saudi Arabia is one of the most bizarre things, taking over 200 of the elites of Saudi Arabia and bringing them into this gilded prison in the Ritz Hotel, and then uh, demanding that they turn over a lot of their assets to him under his control um, before they would be allowed to leave, and 17 of them hospitalized, one of them killed. Uh, and this is, is seen as part of his anti-corruption campaign. This is the same crown prince who, when he was on a vacation in France, saw a yacht that he liked that was owned by a Russian vodka financier and uh, bought it for over $500 million, who owns a chateau in France that's uh, considered the most expensive house in the world. Uh, and that also bought a Picasso picture, the most high-priced painting ever sold in the United States in the world. So um, this is not Robin Hood. And he himself said on 60 Minutes, to be fair, that he is not Gandhi or Mandela, but he is a war criminal. Yeah, and he also said in that interview that uh, he has a great deal of personal wealth, uh, and exactly what you said, that he's neither uh, Mandela or Gandhi, and that this was the way that he spent his money was entirely uh, uh, his own business. Let's just go uh, uh, to a clip uh, of that, responding to a question about his own extravagant lifestyle. My personal life is something I'd like to keep to myself, and I don't try to draw attention to it. If some newspapers want to point something out about it, that's up to them. As far as my private expenses, I'm a rich person. I'm not a poor person. 
I'm not Gandhi or Mandela. I'm a member of the ruling family that existed for hundreds of years before the founding of Saudi Arabia. We own very large lots of land, and my personal life is the same as it was 10 or 20 years ago. So, if Mehdi Hassan, if you want to expand on this, and also what has happened to the Crown Prince's mother? Where is she? So, just on the interview clip you played, I love the idea that I'm not Mandela or Gandhi. I don't think anyone was really going to confuse uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia with Mandela or Gandhi. Although really? Some in the Even US with media, the U.S. press? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add the caveat. Some in the U.S. media may want to portray him in that way. And the bar is so low when it comes to the Saudis. So he becomes Crown Prince and he allows women to drive. And people in the West say, wow, he's an emancipator of women because he allowed women to drive, rather than asking, why was Saudi Arabia the only country in the world where women were not allowed to drive? Why not ask the question? as Medea pointed out, the death penalty for adultery, um, which disproportionately affects women, for sorcery and witchcraft, which disproportionately affects women. When's he getting rid of that? No questions from 60 Minutes about the death penalty. No questions about democracy or freedom or elections. The words didn't come up uh, during the interview. They keep calling him a revolutionary. I've never come across a revolution where the dictator is still in power at the end of it. I thought that's the whole point of a revolution, is to, to get rid of the absolute totalitarian government. So it's bizarre to call this guy a revolutionary. To take your point about his mother, there have been reports in the news uh, that this is a crown prince who basically detained, quote unquote, kidnapped his own mother uh, in order to prevent her from stopping him from taking over from his father. He's one of many children. Saudi kings tend to have a lot of children. He's one of many children to King Salman. King Salman, by you know most accounts, is really not in control of the kingdom. He may have dementia. He's kind of out of it. He's in his 80s. Uh, this guy, 32 years old, Crown Prince, basically runs the show now. He's been very, very uh, efficient in terms of taking power. You've got to give him that. He may, he may, have, he may have botched the war in Yemen, but he's been very good at uh, uh, asserting power at home. He got rid of his cousin, who was the Crown Prince, put him under palace arrest. Uh, he may have kidnapped his mother or detained his mother or hidden her away somewhere so that he, she couldn't get involved in his kind of power takeover from his siblings. Uh, he locked up all these princes and business leaders, as Medea pointed out. Basically, it was a shakedown, to use her uh, very appropriate phrase. Um, and now he's consolidated all this power uh, in himself, in the country, uh, at this young age. But the problem is, he's not very good at doing what he does in terms of foreign policy. Let's see what he does on economic policy. He's great pals with Jared Kushner. Namin mentioned earlier about how they hung out till four o'clock in the morning uh, the week before the purge. Uh, he and Jared Kushner are great pals. That's the connection to the Trump administration. And I always think they're very, they're very similar, Jared Kushner and MBS. They're both 30-something spoilt brats who are deeply overrated and mess up everything they touch. We're going to go to break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Saudi Arabia and Iran. We're also going to talk about the case that's uh, taking place in Israel-Palestine right now of 17-year-old Ahad Tamimi, who has just reached a plea deal with the Israeli military. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute. Got a friend in me by Randy Newman. This is Democracy Now. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh as we talk about the visit of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, a dear friend of Jared Kushner, senior advisor to President Trump. His visit to the White House with President Trump, as President Trump announced an additional $12.5 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia. Well, and let's go now to Trump and Prince Mohammed bin Salman's position on Iran. Trump has long vowed 
vowed to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. And just before Salman's visit, the Saudi foreign minister called the 2015 deal a, quote, flawed agreement. In his 60 Minutes interview, MBS, as the crown prince is called, repeatedly criticized Iran. As Mehdi Hassan mentioned in the first part of our interview, uh, he suggested, Salman suggested, that Iranian-backed Houthi rebels were responsible for the humanitarian crisis in Yemen and defended his claim that Iran's self-appointed spiritual leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, is, quote, the new Hitler of the Middle East. Salman also said Iran is providing safe haven to al Qaeda operatives. Unfortunately, Iran is playing a harmful role. The Iranian regime is based on pure ideology. Many of the al-Qaeda operatives are protected in Iran, and it refuses to surrender them to justice and continues to refuse to extradite them to the United States. This includes the son of Osama bin Laden, the new leader of al-Qaeda. He lives in Iran and works out of Iran. He is supported by Iran. When asked whether the rift between Saudi Arabia and Iran was about a battle for Islam, Salman suggested Iran is in no position to compete with the kingdom. Iran is not a rival to Saudi Arabia. Its army is not among the top five armies in the Muslim world. The Saudi economy is larger than the Iranian economy. Iran is far from being equal to Saudi Arabia. So, Mehdi Hassan, can you comment uh, on what uh, uh, the Crown Prince said in this interview uh, from accusing the Houthi rebels uh, of being responsible for the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, uh, calling uh, uh, the self-appointed spiritual leader Ayatollah Khamenei of Iran the new Hitler of the Middle East, and finally accusing Iran of providing a safe haven uh, for al-Qaeda? So, just deal with each of those in turn. The Yemen point about the Houthi rebels. Look, human rights groups agree that the Houthi rebels in Yemen have carried out war crimes and have exploited the aid and humanitarian situation. But they also agree that the vast majority of civilian deaths have been at the hands of the Saudi-led coalition, their bombing campaign, and that the major cause of the humanitarian cat catastrophe, the, the cholera crisis in Yemen, is the Saudi-led blockade of Yemen, the humanitarian restrictions on aid going in, the closures of ports, uh, the bombing of refineries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, they've placed the majority of blame on the Saudis. So MBS was just lying when he said that on Sunday on 60 Minutes. That's according to the UN, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, etc. In terms of the Iran-Saudi feud, which is really what this is all about, and his visit to the US is all about shoring up uh, Saudi, uh, shoring up American support for any kind of Saudi attempt to put Iran in its place. Let's be clear, Iranian foreign policy has been awful in the region, especially in Syria. No one's defending Iran's horrific role in supporting Bashar al-Assad's war crime in Syria. But the idea that, uh, number one, Iran is responsible for al-Qaeda, which is what he suggested, is absurd, given Saudi Arabia is the country most identified by experts with al-Qaeda over the years. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. Um, the U.S. State Department said in 2009 in a leaked cable that Saudi Arabia constitutes the most significant source of funding for Sunni terrorist groups worldwide. The 28 unredacted pages of the Congressional Inquiry into 9-11 suggested there were links between uh, uh, some of the hijackers and their associates and members of the Saudi government. So this idea that the Saudis will come along and say, those guys over there, they're responsible for al-Qaeda. It's like, it's, like you know, it's like somebody from Sicily coming and saying the rest of the world is responsible for the mafia. I don't know. I can't think of an analogy. It's such an absurd claim from the Saudis. Um, and on the specific issue of Iranian uh, leader Ay Ayatollah Khamenei, who's the, 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 uh, the unelected supreme leader in Iran, on the idea of him being Hitler, I love the Hitler analogy from MBS, because he then goes on, as you played the clip, to say, well, Iran's got basically an awful economy and a tiny military. But hold on, they're also Nazi Germany. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, the Gulf countries between them spend far more than Iran does on the military. Uh, they have much bigger economies. And this is not about an actual threat. No one believes that Iranian tanks are going to roll into Saudi Arabia or that Iran's about to take over the Middle East. They do, however, have a real problem uh, on a sectarian level. Saudi Arabia has been promulgating anti-Shia ideology for many years. Iran is a Shia country. There's definitely a huge sectarian element in terms of uh, some of the political hatred uh, between the two countries. Saudi Arabia has been fanning those flames. And actually, that would be a question for MBS while he's on his America tour. If you're this moderate re uh, reformer who wants to bring about moderate Islam, what are you going to do about all the anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-Shia, anti-atheist anti rhetoric that goes on inside the kingdom? So, 
Let's talk about why they are getting so much coverage, uh, positive coverage. Uh, Medea Benjamin, starting with, and it was well before this, but um, uh, you had the Friedman piece in The New York Times. I don't know if they've gotten so much response to almost anything that they got with uh, um, his PR piece on MBS, on Mohammed bin Salman, when he went to Saudi Arabia. Can you talk about the amount of money and which lobbying firms, um, PR firms, uh, that the Saudi Arabia is investing in to burnish its image, um, not to mention think tanks and universities across the United States. It's quite remarkable the way the Saudis have managed to infiltrate within the United States. You talk about Russian infiltration, uh, but the Saudis have done it spectacularly. They have about 20 different PR and lobby firms based in Washington, D.C., um, many of them with former senators, congresspeople, uh, people from the Defense Department, uh, who have direct contact with our Congress and our White House and State Department. They have— uh, in, incredible contacts in the think tanks. In fact, in fact, think tanks are putting on events for the Saudi prince while he is here. Uh, they have invested large sums in U.S. Ivy League colleges. So you see um, the kind of ideological infiltration in some of the most important universities in the United States. And uh, then they have invested in Wall Street, uh, and they are now here to invest more uh, in U.S. U.S. companies. They've already invested $3.5 billion in Uber. It seems like they are about to invest more. Uh, they want to uh, uh, spread their money around. Certainly, they have big investments in the oil industry. That's partly why he's going to Houston. They own the largest refinery in the United States right now. So, like it or not, um, the Saudis have infiltrated deep within all kinds of institutions here in the United States. And we see the results in things like these puff pieces that come out that continue to play on this idea that the Saudis should be a U.S. ally. The Saudis should not be a U.S. ally. And it's extremely dangerous, because one of the things we're seeing is the Saudis and the Israelis and the United States coming together to see how they can uh, work better together to attack Iran. And everything that Mohammed bin Salman has done internationally has backfired, and it's all aimed at trying to attack Iran, whether it's the rift he created with Qatar that has backfired and put Qatar closer into the arms of the Iranians, whether his attempt uh, with the uh, capture of the prime minister of Lebanon to create a rift with Hezbollah, which is close to the Iranians. That backfired. Uh, and now I think the Israelis and the Saudis want to see the United States get out of the Iran nuclear deal. And uh, it is on May 12th that the uh, Trump administration will have to decide whether it continues to uh, stay in that deal or not. And certainly the pressure coming from the Saudis and the Israelis is uh, to move out of that. And I think it, it is extremely dangerous with this very rash um, president we have and the very rash Saudi uh, prince that we could be going down the path of war with Iran. To ask now uh, uh, both of you, uh, Medea and Mehdi, about the 15th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. In The New York Times earlier this week, marking the anniversary, Iraqi poet and writer Sinan Antoun wrote a piece headlined, 15 years ago, America destroyed my country. Antoun writes, quote, the invasion of Iraq is often spoken of in the United States as a blunder or even a colossal mistake. It was a crime. Those who perpetrated it are still at large. The pundits and experts who sold us the war still go on doing what they do. I never thought that Iraq could ever be worse than it was during Saddam's reign, but that is what America's war achieved and bequeathed to Iraqis. Uh, so that's Sinan Antoun, an Iraqi uh, a writer and poet uh, uh, here in New York City, uh, the author of uh, several books on uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, Mehdi Hassan, could you comment on, on what he said and the situation in Iraq now, what we know of the situation in Iraq now? So, let me just take those two claims in reverse order. I, I think, clearly, uh, the lives of Iraqis across the board have not improved uh, since 2003, especially in terms of economic terms. It's a disaster in terms of human rights. I think 
Many Iraqis would dispute his characterization uh, that it's worse now than under Saddam. I think people who were uh, gassed under Saddam or in prison would obviously dispute that. But we can argue the fact that we even have to argue whether it was better or worse suggests what a disaster Iraq was. That you know the bar of Saddam couldn't even be exceeded very easily by the American occupation and, and this so-called uh, you know freedom for Iraqis. In terms of the actual description of the war, I think he's spot on. It's something I've been saying for years. It annoys me when people say, oh, the Iraq war, it was a, it was a geostrategic error. It was a, a colossal blunder. Uh, it was a failure. No, it was a crime. It was a defiance of international law, uh, and it was defined over, over the last 15 years by war crimes, by widespread torture, by human rights abuses, by massacres at Haditha, at Mahmoudia, at Balad. Recently, I interviewed uh, General, retired General Mark Kimmett, who was a spokesman for the U.S. military coalition in Iraq, and he basically denied that there ever been any massacres. He's kind of saying, no, no, I don't think American soldiers killed anyone intentionally, when there have been American soldiers have gone to prison for killing Iraqis uh, intentionally. So this is, this is the kind of level of amnesia and distortion and spin when it comes to remembering Iraq. This idea that the Americans went in and it was a mistake. That's the, that's the consensus now. No, it was more than a mistake. It was a crime. And the big scandal, Nameen, is that no one's been held accountable. George Bush is painting paintings and dancing with Ellen on her show. Uh, a lot of these people have been rehabilitated in the Trump era. A lot of people were awful because of the Iraq war, because they criticized Trump. We now give them a pass. Uh, a lot of the pundits in the media, Bill Crystal is sitting, smiling on CNN, even though he helped pave the war, a way for war. Donald Trump wants to bring John Bolton back as national security advisor, the man who probably did more than anyone else in the Bush administration to push the case uh, for the invasion of Iraq. So there's been no accountability for what was essentially a war crime. And Medea Benjamin, if you could quickly comment before we go to Israel-Palestine to talk about Ahed Tamimi. Well, I think that there's one sector that's gotten rich off both the Iraq war and the war in Yemen right now, and that's the weapons industry and uh, the defense contractors. And I think we should recognize that war is profitable for a small sector of this country and that the jobs that are being created are jobs that have to be transformed into jobs that uh, deal with clean, green energy and a new kind of economy that we need. And that's why we've created this campaign uh, that is called Divest from the War Machine. It's 70 different organizations. You can look at divestfromwarmachine.org and get involved with us and say, let's get out of the business of making a killing on killing and turn our economy into something that's more life-affirming. Before we wrap up the show, I want to get to what happened in Israel, a military court reaching a plea deal Wednesday with Ahed Tamimi, the 17-year-old Palestinian girl who became a hero uh, to Palestinians after viral video showed her slapping a soldier near her family's home in the occupied West Bank uh, after Ahed Tamimi had just learned her 15-year-old cousin, Mohammed Tamimi, had been shot in the head at close range by an Israeli soldier using a rubber-coated steel bullet. Ahad Tamimi faced 12 charges, including assaulting a soldier, inciting to violence. Under the terms of the plea deal, she'll um, uh, be sentenced to eight months in jail and must pay something like $1,400. Um, can you respond? When she was in court, uh, she shouted out, there is no justice under the occupation, Medea. Well, there is certainly no justice under the occupation. She was in a military court, and the military court has a conviction rate of 99 percent. So she knew she was going to get years unless she did this plea bargain. We consider it a victory because she was facing about 10 years in prison. She'll be out now in five months because she served three months already. And we're trying to get her a visa to come to the United States to speak here. It will be very exciting because she is now a hero for millions of people around the world, and we have to get her voice out. We need help with people to get her, her visa and to get her out speaking here to help change the minds of people in this country about our policies towards Israel-Palestine and in favor of the Palestinian rights. We have to leave it there. Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink, author of the article Don't Believe the Media Hype about Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, we'll link to that at Common Dreams. And thanks so much to Mehdi Hassan, award-winning British journalist and broadcaster at Al Jazeera English, host of Al Jazeera interview program up front, columnist for The Intercept, is just launching his own podcast. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Democracy Now! is produced by an amazing group of people and a very special happy birthday to Miriam Barnard.